Alright, so what if I was to tell you that this Wendy's here was the site of a major battle between Native Americans and Mormon settlers back in the 1800s? What would be your reaction to that? Um, I don't know, I'd be kind of surprised because, like, I mean, it's like I walk by it every day to get to school, so I mean, it doesn't seem very important. I mean, with being from here, I mean, I know that. I mean, I know that they weren't super friendly, so I mean, I don't know if I believe this site, but like, sure, that could be a thing. I have no idea about that. Um, I mean, other than your word for it, but I mean, <laughs> if it's true, that maybe they could put up a plaque or something, I don't know. Some call it the Battle of Provo River. Others, the Battle for Utah. The story was straightforward. Old Bishop, a Timpanogos youth, stole a shirt from a clothesline at Fort Utah. An effort to retrieve the shirt resulted in a scuffle and Old Bishop was shot and dumped in the Provo River. The youth retaliated by firing on the fort, so the settlers surrounded the youth camp and drove them out of the valley. It is a classic story of Western settlement and conflict and is memorialized by nearby Squaw Peak, named for the wife of Big Elk who, according to tradition, climbed the cliffs of Rock Canyon to escape the advancing settlers and slipped to her death. Apart from brief mentions in local history books, the Provo River battle faded into obscurity despite its importance in development not only of Provo, but the entire state of Utah. It was not a single incident of violence, but rather the spark that lit off a decade of warfare, finally ending with the creation of the Uinta Ore Reservation, where most northern youths live today. It is also much more complex than the simple theft of a shirt, a complicated story of cultural conflict. I I always maintain that the truth has to come out in order for people to heal, in order for two groups to learn from their conflicts. And then people, we have our skeletons too. You know, we fought each other constantly. Um, there, was, there was violence and bloodshed between the tribes often. So it's, it's not like we were perfect people either. We were not and neither were the Mormon settlers. Um, it was just the way things were at that point in time. Utah Valley was an oasis in the desert. Utah Lake and the Provo River provided lush grasses, wild plants, fish and large game, supporting a large population of northern Utes. The Utes, part of the numic speaking peoples which included the Shoshone to the north and the Paiutes to the south, were organized into family groups. A few groups together formed a band and several united bands formed the tribe. These groups, while generally peaceful, often warred over resources, especially around the lake. When the Mormons arrived in the area, the Utes were no stranger to Europeans, as the Spanish had contact with them since 1776 and traded horses and supplies for slaves. The only reliable information I'm aware of is the, the Catholic priests, um, Dominguez and Escalante's journal. Um, which um, covers their observations when they came out of uh, Spanish, uh, Spanish Fort Canyon. And their observations were basically that the youth were living quite well. There were hundreds of teepees living along the, or placed along the Provo River. They witnessed um, fish drying on racks, children and dogs playing, and, and, and uh, ponies uh, in the pasture or grazing. Um, acre upon acre of corn, and including hemp. Of course, the lake was the dominating feature of the valley. It had been used by a prehistoric man for many years as a source for, for waterfowl and, and fish. Uh, so, it was arguably the best valley in Utah territory as far as uh, being able to get a living from the land. The Ute people had acquired the horse um, very early from the Spanish. Uh, Shoshone lore says as early as the uh, 1550s. Um, there's a, an account of an a armed conflict with the Spanish on the Arkansas River southeastern Colorado, in which uh, our people were taken prisoner and watched how the horse was being used and planned an escape on horseback. And 
and began rounding up strays and they adapted to the um, horse culture very well and became a very powerful tribe. There were several things that made the valley, Utah Valley, desirable for the colonists. Uh, water was the big one. Uh, it was at a premium in the Great Basin and there was a relative abundance of it here in Utah Valley. Of course, the water provided fish and uh, provided the water for Utah Lake. There were actually several fishermen, professional fishermen, who were in the first group of settlers that came down here, and that was uh, a lure. Uh, they wanted to tap the resources of Utah Lake and practice their old trade of fishing. The other possible, well, there are several other uh, factors that lured them down here. They were cattle raisers, and this was a great land for grazing cattle. Fremont noted in his report that it was a good cattle raising area, lots of bunch grass and so forth. So uh, they wanted to bring cattle down. Uh, they also were interested in the industry that they could set up. When the Mormons first arrived, um, their first response was, oh, uh, these people are passing through. Uh, we can trade with them. And so um, they did visit them for that purpose and welcome them because they welcomed everyone who came through pretty much. Uh, so and the Shoshones from the north came um, and visit, visited and traded also. Brigham initially advised against settling Utah Valley at the time, but a small group of three families ignored his specific instructions not to crowd upon the Utes and went anyway, establishing what would later become Provo and building Fort Utah. This fort soon became a serious problem. Not only did it present the Utes with a military obstacle, but the wild game that they depended on diminished rapidly and their traditional trails and campsites were now blocked off by fences and fields. With the newcomers taking up the resources, the increasingly desperate Utes began pilfering livestock and crops to make up for the lost territory and food sources. I'm pretty sure what happened. My guess, this is a guess that the Indian people um, said, well, we're having to go so far for deer and elk now. I'm sure they, they understand they're displacing our animals. Uh, we'll just shoot one of their cows. I'm sure they'll understand. Um, that was the first mistake because <laughs> Mormon settlers valued those animals and the response was quite harsh, which was to kill an Indian. And, and our people were in shock about that. I'm, I'm pretty sure because it's like, well, we gotta eat, you know? We're human beings, we gotta eat. Don't they understand that? With that, we reach the beginning of the battle and the point where the differing stories diverge. The most common story is that old Bishop stole the shirt and was pursued by Rufus Stoddard, Richard Ivey, and Jerome Zabriskie. Other historians suggest that the three Southers were poaching wild game after making a formal agreement not to hunt and killed Old Bishop when he discovered them. Some accounts claim that Old Bishop shot at the Southers with his bow. Others say he was shot in the back as he ran away unarmed. A few Southers recorded that Richard Ivey forced the battle on the rest of the Southers with his inflammatory calls to violence. Regardless of how it happened, Old Bishop was dead and his killers hid his body by cutting open his torso stuffing it with rocks and flinging it into the Provo River. It was not long before his fellow youths found him and confronted the settlers. Realizing the imminent war, the frightened settlers sent Captain Peter Conover, a veteran of the 1832 Black Hawk War in Illinois, and Isaac Higby, the bishop before Utah, to ask for Brigham Young's advice. They met with Young and the Twelve Apostles on January 31, 1850. Bitter that the people for Utah disobeyed his order to stay in the Salt Lake Valley, Young was hesitant to give them any instructions, but recognized that losing Fort Utah would cut off further settlement south of the Salt Lake Valley. Captain Howard Stansbury of the U.S. Army Corps of Topographical Engineers happened to be in the Salt Lake Valley at the time conducting a formal survey of the Western Territories, and he was eager to advise the Mormons. Stansbury, acting as an agent of the federal government, told Brigham Young that violence was the only possible course of action in dealing with the natives. I did not hesitate to say to them that, in my judgment, the contemplated expedition against these savage marauders was a measure not only of good policy, 
but of absolute necessity and self-preservation. I knew the leader of the Indians to be a crafty and bloodthirsty savage who had been already guilty of several murders and had openly threatened that he would kill every white man that he found upon the prairies. In addition to this, I was convinced that the completion of the yet unfinished survey of the Utah Valley, the coming season, must otherwise be attended with serious difficulty, if not actual hazard, and would involve the necessity of a largely increased and armed escort force protection. Such being the circumstances, the course proposed could not but meet my entire approval. On February 2nd, Brigham Young publicly announced his decision to go to war. Stansbury provided the militia with firearms, tents, and ammunition, and sent them on their way to clear a bloody path for his survey party, while Major General Daniel H. Wells of the Navajo Legion, Salt Lake City's local militia, prepared Special Order No. 2 with instructions for the military body. After the decision was made to come to Utah Valley and uh, chastise the Utes, two companies of militia were formed, came south in early February 1850, and uh, after a trip of several days, came into Fort Utah in the dark on the night of February the 7th, met in council and decided what they would do the next day uh, with the youth. They decided to split into two groups, one on each side of the river, go up to the Ute village, which was about a mile northeast along the Provo River, about where the uh, uh, shopping center is today, the Riverside Plaza, and surround the village see if they could rout, roust the Indians out of the village and uh, shoot them down on the clear land, on the open land that was south of the river. So they crept up the river and uh, first of all held a parley or tried to with the Utes. They found the Utes in a really defensible position. They'd created a little fort-like village in one of the dry beds of the Provo River and cut down uh, cottonwoods and made a little stockade, uh, if you will, behind which they could fight. So when the settlers got there, uh, Opakari, the uh, chief who had taken Big Chief's place as the main chief, and Big Elk, who was the war chief, or Old Elk, or just plain Elk, sometimes he was called, came out and talked over the situation. Elk was for a war, so he roused the warriors inside the stockade village and uh, they started to fire and uh, fire was returned and the battle had started. The cannon perched on the roof of Fort Utah's Bowery bombarded the cabin until dark when the militia gave up and returned to the fort to rest. Uh, that night, the, the uh, Leaders decided they'd have to change their tactics. Something a little different would have to be done, but they could also use uh, some of the tactics they used the first day. They creeped up both sides of the river, and uh, a Lieutenant Howland, who was on loan from the topographical engineers of Captain uh, Stansbury, who were surveying the Utah Lake, was on loan to the colonists, also was Dr. Blake to treat the wounded, who was an army doctor. And Howland suggested that one tactic they could try was to move, make uh, V-shaped portable barricades of logs on sled runners covered with heavy blankets and buffalo robes and brush and push them up to where they could get a good uh, view of the village and shoot at closer range into the village. The second day ended, I think the youths were, after fighting two valiant days, were about ready to throw in the breech claw. The only settler who was killed was killed this day. Joseph Higby, the, the son of Isaac Higby, was killed on this day. As he uh, was hiding behind a log, he raised his head to take a peep and see what was happening with the youths. And one of the youths was ready, waiting for his head to pop up, shot him uh, broke his neck, killed him immediately. After the second day of battle, uh, that was on a Saturday, the next day was the Sabbath. I don't think the settlers planned on fighting that day, but they were interested in, in what was going on at the Ute village. So they sent up the river uh, a couple of uh, 
people to scout out what was happening. They came to the village and found it deserted. During the night, the youths had come out of the village, uh, cut up some of the cavalry horses that were killed and, and taken the meat for subsistence and divided into two main groups and split for Rock Canyon, which kind of interestingly, they called the House of God and uh, planned to hold out there. The other group went south down to what we call uh, West Mountain. They called it Table Mountain in those days. At the end, end people put up strong resistance, um, but had to um, move further south into uh, the uh, Spanish Fork area. And um, their resistance was eventually broken there and they fled for the mountains. And um, at one point, uh, after prisoners were taken, um, they uh, pursued them. The militiamen pursued those Indian people and they killed um, many of the warriors. The numbers vary um, from um, 20 to 30 warriors killed and then many more died due to the elements. Uh, my understanding is the snow was high at the time. Um, and so after pursuing those people, uh, it basically broke the, uh, the back of that band, the Timpanogos band. One of the things, a number of things really bothered me and that was the, uh, the killing of the defenseless men who were taken prisoner on Table Mountain. But even, even more than that likely was the fact that uh, they, the settlers, the militia, stayed on the grounds, camped on the grounds for days with the dead bodies still there, frozen uh, in February. And the men who kept guard that night over the camp for the two days, two, three days they were there uh, were were falling over the bodies of the dead youths. The outstretched arms and legs of the corpses, frozen corpses, were tripping them as they made their rounds on, on guard duty. Uh, and then a, a terrible, really terrible thing happened uh, after the, uh, at, toward the end of the Utah Valley campaign when Dr. Blake, the doctor from the topographical engineers, decided that it would be a good idea to have some Indian skulls to take back east with him when he returned east to uh, study, for scientific study. So he hired a couple of Mormon men and a sleigh to go across the lake, the frozen lake, to Table Point and collect some specimens. Uh, these two men went with him, guided him to the spot, and after watching him take off one head with, their, with his scientific uh, you know, you know, expertise, decided he was taking way too long and told him they'd take off the rest and brought out their bowie knives and cut off the heads of the rest of the Indians in a matter of maybe 15 minutes or so, which indicates to me that the, the bodies were grouped in a, in a, a fairly tight circle to uh, be rounded up and, and decapitated in that amount of time. Then they brought the heads back to Fort Utah and eventually to Salt Lake, and unfortunately they were lost. Uh, Blake uh, had an argument with Captain Stansberry, left the group, and, and the heads disappeared. Many decades later, the children of Fort Utah remembered the horrifying day that their fathers carried the disembodied, bloodied heads into their homes. Over the next decade and a half, all further violence between the Utes and Mormons was a direct result of the Provo River Battle. The 13 Timpanogos Utes that escaped up Rock Canyon attacked Salt Lake City that spring and threatened Chief Wakara for his friendliness towards the Mormons, eventually resulting in the Walker War in 1853. Captain Conover kept his company in reserve for three whole years after the battle in case of another major altercation. Conflict did not end until the Treaty of Spanish Fork in 1865, which forced the Utes out of Utah Valley and onto the Uinta Ore Reservation to the east. Even with peace restored, the city of Provo still sits in the shadow of a mountain named for the horrendous death of a victim of this tragedy 
the, the trauma we experience has created lots of problems and confusion. Now, I have a better understanding of history because I'm a student of history. I've been a teacher. Um, I've been a, um, I've studied the history of our state. Most Indian people do not have a, a thorough understanding or even a general understanding. They have bits and pieces of what happened in the past. So consequently, there's lots of confusion and misunderstanding about what happened. And so when they don't understand, they can, they can get confusing visions of what happened, which can lead to confrontation, anger at the self, and after a while they get tired of that and then they start projecting their anger onto other people, including their own people. And so that trauma manifests itself in a lot of ways. Addictions, dysfunction, conflict. Inter-conflict as well as intra-tribal conflict. And so basically my response is that it's caused a lot of trouble because we were confused about what happened to us it, it, the confusion has led to lots of conflict and pain and suffering. Um, and I think that uh, the research that is being conducted about trauma nowadays is, is, is helping us to get a better understanding that we need to go back and piece those things together, get a better understanding of what actually happened, and really understand that when two cultures come together, one agricultural, one Get hunter, hunter and gatherer. In other words, two different cultures coming together, there's going to be conflict. It's just the way it is. And once we understand that, we can take the personal aspect out of it to understand that it's more of a human thing, human conflict. Humans conflict under these circumstances. You see what I'm saying? Once we get that understanding, then we can come to forgive one another and move forward and come together as one people someday. But until that happens, um, it's going, there's going to be more dysfunction, more suffering, more pain and resentment. And I guess we have to look back and see what the people here were like in the past. We can see incidents today that happened that are similar and we know how we feel about them. And sometimes it's a little difficult to feel that same intensity about things that occurred in the past. but. Um, we need to know that they had foibles just like we do today, I think. I think the day, when the day comes when we can sit down <clears throat> and discuss these things and both own up to our shortcomings because we both, both sides have shortcomings, um, it's the day things will change. But until then, and we have to stay at the table. You know what I'm saying? We gotta, as bad as it hurts, uh, we gotta stay at the table. And we're gonna get mad at each other and walk away sometimes, but if we'll come back and stay at the table, someday we'll get along. But until that happens, if we continue to operate on pretense and inaccurate information or sugar-coated information, it's not gonna work.